Maybe they won't. Wow, I don't know. That Maybe they'll crazy. just require the OS, the OS, all the kernel teams to do everything. Well, the yeah. good news is, Rocco, you already give all your information to Google, so now you're just giving it to everybody else. Yeah, probably. <laughs> 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 now you're just sharing with everyone. Always well, Google price. has it. I mean, <laughs> how am I starting this out? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you so introduced you, that guy right yeah, there. Okay. All right. Good. So <laughs> meltdown. So we, this, we just had a case of the podcast meltdown. Rocco, where is our producer? We have no producer. We are PZ less. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and it shows. It it's shows. taken us an hour and a half. <laughs> to this point. So clearly, we miss you, Zeb. <laughs> Zeb, get back soon, will you? Rocco has been unhinged. He's been sitting here for 40 hours theming <laughs> the whole day. I mean, there were a couple of pixels off. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody ready? We're going to do this. Let's right. do this. Let's rock it. Band. Leak. That was dumb, I know. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast. Welcome to episode 53. I'm Rocco. And I'm Ryan. And this is Destination Linux. Ryan, what's going on, man? It's been a fun week. Listen, everybody knows me as the XFCE guy, but I've been dipping my toes in new waters this week. What have you been dipping into, man? KDE Neon. I'm still in KDE Neon. Three of my computers are on KDE Neon. I wonder if it had anything to do with an interview last week with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely had a big thing to do. And you know, look, I, I loved KDE back in the Manjaro days mm -hmm. and um, eventually found XFCE. And then the, of course, super ultra intelligent i3. Of course. Uh, Something I never this, got well, into. It's all, it's only for people with high Q IQs of like 135 up. Right. But once you get that IQ, then you can run I3. But then I, I you know, after the interview, I want, we wanted to check out KD Neon and it stayed on my machine. But part of that is because of Scrap. It's Scrap's fault. Scrapjaw. Scrapjaw. SJ Studios. That's right. SJ Studios. Check out his YouTube channel. But it's a lot of it is his fault, honestly, why I haven't switched. Because he set my system up with this. All my audio equipment now is actually set up right. <laughs> Imagine that. It actually works. <laughs> it actually works. And everything's done through Jack. And honestly, I can finally switch this week because I was able to take things to scrap again. Take the bash script and customize it for Mixer and Cadence and Carla and all of that so that auto starts. So now I don't have to do anything. If I switch distros, I just move that bash file over after I do the install and everything will be good. So... Now I have all this fancy sound mixing equipment set up properly, software and hardware wise, and I'm still on KDE Neon and it's, it's good, man. I really like it. Well, I used to run KDE Neon, but, um, you know, I'm running Ubuntu Mate now. Oh my gosh. So, uh, the prediction with Solus was not, it doesn't count. We just mark that as wrong. It doesn't count. I mean, you can mark it as wrong, mm -hmm. but it doesn't count because um, it was made and broken before the new year started. So, so, so I mean, why Mate? There are so many distros out there, so many choices, so many great things. And you go ma Mate. Not that Mate is not great, but why Mate? Because of its stability. Because okay. everything just works in it. Because the only reason that I switched away from it before was because I wanted to try out the new and shiny. Gotcha. Everything just works right in it. Um, I, I would be on Zubuntu right now if I could get the dual monitor gaming issue worked out, but I can't. Right. And that seems to me to be specific to my hardware because not too many other people have that issue, but I couldn't get it worked out. So, you know, I install Ubuntu Mate and everything just works on the right screen. Uh, it doesn't crash. It just, all the programs are there and they work well. And it's just the old, it's just the standby. It's the, it's like an, it's almost like an LTS type situation where 
if you want something to just work, you, you use Ubuntu Mate. So that's kind of like your old friend. When you when you need a break from all the distro hopping and broken stuff, you go Ubuntu Mate. Even as I distro hopped from GNOME and other ones, I would always keep an Ubuntu Mate install on my other drive on one of the other partitions because I knew I could always boot into that and things would work. So that's where I'm at. So another thing I was messing with this week, Rocco, was uh, Plasma Mobile. But this is not Plasma Mobile. This is Ubuntu's mobile uh, version here that actually works. Because Plasma Mobile is way alpha. It is, and I, it's it's so alpha, and so it's not your cameras don't work. The uh, if you try to update stuff to the Discovery Store. It doesn't work. So, it, and they they say it's very alpha. So, I, right. UB UB ports, um, Ubuntu Mobile is well, on the opposite side. They're a little more further ahead in their development, and so I had to move my Nexus Five to that. Well, let uh, me ask you, what the? I mean, it's alpha, but what uh -huh. does it does it have the promise that of of a true plasma KDE system? Like, does it have that promise there that someday it'll be there? I mean, the it, it's so early alpha. I, I didn't realize when I was downloading it, installing it, how early alpha it was. But the if you're talking about from a GUI standpoint, yeah, then yes, it looks KDE beautiful, typical KDE plasma look. Uh, with that said, everything underneath is not working for the most part. Um, so there's just a lot of work left to do and you could not use it as a daily driver yet in my opinion now that's with the nexus 5 the nexus 5x is another one they recommend with and perhaps on the 5x is a little more powerful hardware maybe they're writing for that more than the 5 i don't know they list both phones but that was my experience with it is it was pretty it was pretty early stages right so this one that you have on now is working pretty good i love it it's fantastic it's absolutely ready for mainstream uh, again, it's done by UB ports. The installation is as simple as you could imagine uh, a phone being. You don't have to, you know, be a hacker, spend all your time in the terminal. You can download an app and it pretty much does all the work through a GUI, UB ports GUI uh, for you. Very similar to how Plasma did it, uh, but just absolutely beautiful ability to switch between, you know, your music, your videos. They have a store there for you to download apps. They have apps in there like YouTube, et cetera. And apparently they're working on an Android option, which allows you to install Android apps in it as well. So in any case, our dream for a true Linux device may be getting closer. Plasma could still be it, but it's just not ready yet. Do not recommend you playing with it just unless you want to see what it looks like. But uh, UB ports Ubuntu looks amazing. Nice. Well, this week so, I've been looking at trying to find a new video conferencing app. <laughs> it didn't go how's too that well, gone? dude. It didn't go too well, man. Um, oh, no, I remember so much success. Well, there was a guy that's in front of me that was helping me out um, testing it. And yep. no, it wasn't going too well, man. So here's the thing. We <laughs> set out to find, we use Zoom to connect our Right. video and we use that also on the big daddy links live show that we stream and we're, we were looking for an alternative to it and to see if there was maybe an open source alternative or even a better an option and if we would have found one that had all the features that zoom already has we would have switched to it but pretty much at, for what we needed to do there is no better option than Zoom right now. I mean, and don't just trust us. We had PZ there too. Yeah. Everybody trusts PZ. PZ was like, dude, <laughs> you guys got to stop. Go back to Zoom. This is terrible. There was there were some that had promises, but there were always missing features. And it seemed like a lot of them utilized Linux as a third, like a second thought. Right. Versus being their mainstay. Like I, I'm familiar with some of these programs we used in a Windows platform. And they're not as stripped down as the Linux versions were, which I think was kind of shameful on their part. But Zoom is very functional. So there you go. The small problems we had with Zoom that made us look, small problems I had. Go ahead and say it, Rocco. Uh, the small problems that Ryan had with Zoom. 
uh, are pretty much nothing uh, when you compare you can, what the features that it gives you and the ability that that it gives us to manipulate what we need to do to make the podcast and put everything where we want it. So yeah, so there you go. Zoom. But if you have a recommendation, send it to us and we'll take a look at it. We probably already tried it because we went through like nine, <laughs> but if you have one, send it to us. We will take a look at it and see. Yep. So last week we talked to Jonathan Riddle mm -hmm. and we talked to him about KDE. And even though there was a lot of good points to KDE, we also brought up some of the negative points, including discover. Yep. And this week they came out with an article polishing discover center. We did it Rocco. Uh, it probably had nothing to do with what we no. talked about. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> it probably had nothing to do with it. It's perfect timing, but... But it is good timing. Uh, the coincidence is incredible. So uh, one of the developers put out an article to talk about which items they're going to be working on, which ones they've already fixed. And mm -hmm. it's actually pretty exciting because one of the things we talked about was um, the listing of all of the apps being installed. And yeah. there's no sorting whatsoever. None. Zippo. No. Oh, that's fixed now. It's put in there as a patch, and it will be right. probably in the next release of KDE. So I guess in right. 5.12, that'll be in there. But I can tell you the stability issues. It talks about in here some of the bugs that they did fix. The you know um, Fixed a large number of crashes, and they give the KDE bug numbers here. Um, and just a whole plethora of little changes and switches. And I can tell you in using it this week, Incredible difference. Incredible difference. I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's usable, uh, much more usable now than it was before. And as far as the crashing and things that I was having, I'm not having it right now. My fear is, my fear honestly is, is this going to stay this way? Or as they do new updates and changes, do we go back to kind of discover being in the crash mode? So I'm hoping that it stays in its current usable state. I know that's a weird wish, yeah. but that, that, that's my wish because well, so much of KDE is so amazing. I mean, that's important to point out. Like, I love it. KDE Connect, the vault, the whole experience, the GUI, it's beautiful. But Discover was that one thing that just honestly was not ready for prime time at the time I was using it. But now it feels ready again. Well, KDE Neon is always going to give you the latest uh, KDE. So you right. always run that risk of of having the latest software where you get some of the bugs that haven't been worked out yet. So there may be times, there may be stretches where KD Neon is like super stable. And then mm -hmm. there may be stretches where it's not so super stable and there are crashes and they have to work those things out. So that's, that's a, a downside to running the user edition. I guess if you want the stability, you're going to have to go with the LTS. Yeah. Well, we'll see. All right, so we, we, what do you think about mail apps, dude? Well, listen, I, I've told you before, you told me about MailSpring. I switched to MailSpring. You now, or I know why you told me to switch to MailSpring now. I, I originally thought because it was such a nice looking app, but now I realize it was because you wanted to track how many times I distro hop. <laughs> so, because it sends an email. <laughs> every time Ryan signs into the account, it sends an email saying somebody signed in. So it's a big email that goes out, security alert, somebody hacked into your account. <laughs> somebody signed into a different location. <laughs> so he knows every time I distro hop because it sends another email saying a new user is signed up. But uh, there's more people that have tried MailSpring. So we yeah. got an email, an email from a listener that had that said we mentioned MailSpring. So what was it about? Well, the user, Jim, basically stated that, you know, he downloaded it based on your recommendation, Rocco. Oh, wow. And was extraordinarily disappointed. No, he didn't say that. He was super nice. Sure but he, he basically was. he basically pointed out that. I'll learn you. <laughs> I'll learn you. <laughs> he basically pointed out that there were some security concerns that he had had after basically downloading MailSpring, installing it. He entered the mail server's username and password. Almost instantly, it downloaded the IMAP mail file. Um, and then he talks about the email servers on the box basically connecting to all of his servers, associated servers. Yeah, there should have been an error thrown because of the way the server was set up. 
and there wasn't. So when he tries uh, Thunderbird and um, other programs, it will throw up an error if it's not set up right. And it should have thrown an error with Mailspring, but it didn't. And that was concerning to him. So he right. decided that he's not going to use it. And to be honest with you, Mailspring is a beautiful mail app. And did I say that it's finally working with Hushmail? Did I say that? What is that now? Is that Mailspring or is that Mailspring. the other one that looks like Mailspring? No, that Nihilus oh. is uh, Nihilus is actually not maintained anymore. So that's okay. why uh, the, that's actually why Mailspring came about because Nihilus was a promising email app that they said was going to be a free app and then all of a sudden they stopped so wait a minute it. you recommend mail spring to jim jim switches then you recommend nihilus to no, me and nihilus isn't even supported I'm how not, dare you rocco i think you're imagining things did i recommend <laughs> nihilus <laughs> okay uh but nihilus actually uh worked like i was trying both of them at the same time and mm -hmm. nihilus worked a little bit better than Mailspring in certain areas like with Hushmail. So, but Mailspring, like I said, now works with Hushmail as far as the syncing is up to date and correct. So. Wouldn't it just be easier to use Thunderbird at this point? It is, but it's so. The theming's off. It's just off. <laughs> maybe. Well, they're doing, they're maybe, doing updates to it. Yeah, maybe when Ryan uh, uh, gets everybody coordinated we can get some updates and make the theme a little bit better in thunderbird i'm working on getting people coordinated oh you meant that guy yeah the other guy the other ryan yeah. all right mm -hmm. so rocco if uh unless you lived under a rock you've heard of uh, meltdown inspector what's wrong with living under a rock dude <laughs> <laughs> and meltdown inspector uh, we've all heard about these vulnerabilities, all the impacts it's going to have, but I think it would be better if we uh, let brought somebody on who's a little more intelligent uh, in speaking about this. Yeah. So we're going to bring on, I know that, you know, even now, uh, sometimes my eyes glaze over when I hear things talking about Meltdown Inspector because it's, it's pretty much played out, but I think it's something that still needs to be said. So we're going to bring on Michael Tunnell from TuxDigital.com. And we're going to get the lowdown on Meltdown and Spectre. So we bring in Michael Tunnell, who was on Destination Linux back in episode 18, I believe. Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. All right. So let's talk about Meltdown and Spectre. How serious of an issue is this, Mike? Probably the most serious that we've ever seen, really, that's been announced in the past at least 20 years or so. Like it's, it's pretty bad. Okay. So let's talk about each one individually because they're different. They cover uh, different things. They're, they're, they're on this, they're in the same type of family ish of an issue, but they are, they, they affect different things. Yep. All right. So meltdown, A meltdown is something that I believe you need to have malicious software on your computer already. And it also affects the Intel CPUs. Yes. And so, some arm and some arm. So, why do I need to be concerned? Because I have an i7 right now. Why do I need to be concerned about it? Well, I mean, you have to be concerned because like, even if it's a small uh, attack of any kind could happen, it could become a point where any data that is in your RAM and in the kernel memory, so everything essentially, could be stripped out and extracted from the system. So that could be any data that is currently being activated or previously been activated still in the history can be extracted from the RAM, both in the main memory RAM of like just basic usage and also in the history memory of the kernel. So like what it previously used in a prior execution. So that means passwords, encrypted documents, all of that stuff's up for grabs. Yeah. Anything that's been loaded and executed recently or in the past, like not recently as in like the, for that day you've run it, but like recently in the past of like how long the cache has been utilized, which is usually based on how the distro and the, kernel flags are set to how long that is. So it, it could be, it varies depending on what the kernel is, what they're saying. Can you validate? I've heard that, you know, Rocco mentioned certain software being able to execute meltdown, but I've heard it's something as simple as the JavaScript written on a website could trigger this whole thing. The, the JavaScript is a Spectre ex execution. Okay. That's um, the different one. All right. You can, you can technically make the Spectre execution affect um, like a farther reaching thing so that you can use Spectre to then affect meltdown. 
but it that's 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 a pretty big leap to do. It's still possible, but it's 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 um it's been mitigated quite a bit by most browsers at this point. So they're similar. How are they different? They both work on a speculative evaluation and a speculative execution of kernel uh, kernel memory and batch prediction. They both they both use or ban- branch prediction. Sorry, they both use the same thing except one is kernel specific and the other one is all encompassing of all kinds of things. So you could say that meltdown is a as a derivative sort of of specter. So like they do, they both work in the same way except one affects I would say like the meltdown is more like potentially dangerous because it can go to the kernel, but specter is more uh more of a nasty bug because it's it's more widespread. So like with Meltdown, you can use the kernel to solve the problem. And Spectre requires a lot more from various different vendors to solve that problem because it, it's v- much more wide reaching. So it's it's more of an issue of this this particular application could be running in user space and it could check w- another application of user space. Whereas Meltdown is using the user space checking of, of the, uh, the speculative specu- speculation execution to look into the kernel itself. So the kernel memory is from user space. So what the mit- mitigation process is to remove the user space kernel connection so like you can't you go from user space to get into kernel anymore. But the Spectre only affects AMD from what I understand? No, Spectre affects everything. Spectre yeah. affects everything. Okay. Pretty so there was a lot of conversation though, Rocco, to your point that was coming out in the news because people really didn't know what was going on. I think when it first hit, is that <clears throat> Meltdown doesn't affect AMD. That was a big one that mm-hmm. we kind of heard. And then there were press mm-hmm. releases out there from AMD alluding to the fact, they didn't really say it, but alluding to the fact that may not be as impactful to them. But what we're kind of finding out, or can you, I guess, validate, are, are both, to Rocco's point, impacting all processors? Or there's some where it impacts more? Are you safer on AMD than you are on Intel? What's the story there? There's a wide variety of, of, of um, effect. So it's, it's kind of, it's hard to say because uh, AMD's situation is that they're not affected by meltdown because they already use page, page table isolation. That is what the kernel is being, is, is what the Linux kernel is using right now to solve the Linux uh, meltdown problem for Intel. The AMD said that they're already using that in their, car, in their kernel hardware itself so that they don't have to worry about it because they've already mitigated that possibility. So that's why they're not affected there. But as far as Spectre goes, they're definitely affected. Uh, they're, they're affected in different ways depending on the hardware and depending on the use case. So it's it's kind of... The, AMD is... Some processors are not affected at all, but most of them are. And as far as Intel, it's pretty much all of them. So how long has this been out? How long have, have developers known about this? Well... We don't know for sure. We know at least June it was an it was give, the information was given to Intel and AMD and the tier one vendors. We know at least uh, in November Canonical and vendors like that were given information about it being done or about about that problem existing. So we don't know how far back it goes exactly, but we know at least June of last year and uh, at least most v- vendors got it in November of this of last year. So the Google cybersecurity arm known as project zero is what they're who they're saying discovered this originally uh back in mid 2017 so they obviously have android devices and other things that have some base in linux so why did ubuntu only find out in november versus other people hearing about it sooner is there any speculation on that uh there's a bunch of theories about how some some tier one uh, some vendors are considered tier one vendors and some vendors are considered like, you know, multiple, like how important are you to get the attention and sort of, wow. and uh, we, we don't know exactly why some were given access in November, why some were given access in June. We think it's because the June was because it was given just to manufacturers, but we have reports that some people got it earlier than that because uh, Apple released their fix for OS 10 or Mac OS, like n- some mid December and they didn't, they we and there was no way they would have got that that information in November and fixed it that quickly. 
Right. Well, so, Android also patched in December, which obviously they would have had it early, right? Because Google is kind of yeah. the discovery portal. Yeah. And then Ubuntu isn't supposed to receive the patch until January 9th. Is that still the case? Well, the January 9th thing was more of um, this when the CRD was supposed to be announced. And that just means like the the reveal of the, the vulnerability, including those patches for those vulnerabilities. The same thing that happened with gotcha. Crack, except this happened earlier than it was supposed to. Um so like people have found out about this on like January 2nd or so. Um, I'm not sure exactly the date when it, when it was first leaked, but when it was, when it was leaked and people started recognizing it, they, then Google had to like, cause it was first being called the KPTI issue, but that's not exactly the same. That's not exactly the, the reality because it was, it was more overreaching than that. So they wanted to, so Google went ahead and just told everybody what's going on. So the, the reason why they didn't get it out until the, the ninth is because um, the, you want to have enough time for that. Everybody who wants to work on it has time to develop this, the software and the, the information is not out there. And so soon that there's not a, a way to mitigate it yet. So the same thing happened with crack when November 16th last year, there was a release for all the patches, like the, the day one that all the information came out, all the, like all the vendors had plenty of time to develop for it. So this was the same kind of thing, except it got out sooner. So they had to kind of rush a little bit. So when will all of the Ubuntu and everybody get patched or have they already been? Um, there's really no way to say exactly Like some parts have been patched and some haven't. Um, for example, the meltdown patch has been, has been uh, mitigated. Uh, it, that's been pushed out since uh, RC seven for it, four fifteen RC seven. And so uh, four fourteen twelve has it and a bunch of other versions like the other older, older LTS versions and stuff like that. Those all have updates for this patch exactly when all the distros are going to have it. It's hard to say. I would say that probably um, Ubuntu will have it, if not on the ninth, guaranteed to send that week. Like, I, I mean, my guarantee is not worth, it's not Ubuntu. So right. I, can't really get, I can't really promise it, but I would be very shocked if they didn't. Because gotcha. they, they, they're typically, once the CRD is set, they're ready to go on that day. So I'd be shocked if they weren't. So how does this affect distros um, if you're on an older kernel? If you stay, if they don't the update their kernel for the new patches. Of, yeah. Like there's different types of there's different branches of the kernel that are being updated. So like you can get some old, old as far back as three dot x kernel. I forgot which version has that, but there are multiple versions of the kernel that are being patched. So if, as long as you're using one of those and you update to that, then you're fine. Uh, if a distro is using some odd number that's not being maintained anymore. Um, that could be problematic because they wouldn't they wouldn't have this fix at all. They'd have to either manually the user would have to manually change their kernel, or they'd have to hope the distro updates. That's it, because there's there's really no way to fix it without the kernel update. And as far as Spectre goes, that's not even fixed yet. Like we don't know exactly how long that's going to be. It could be a couple more weeks. It could be a month or two. I don't know. It's a it's the um, the Spectre issue is not as scary because of the depth it goes because it doesn't go as far as meltdown but it's more re far reaching and it affects w much more processors and it has a bigger uh hit hit space so right. it could be it's it's it, they're equally scary because one goes really deep and the other one is just so widespread that it's hard to like uh, narrow it down now, people are saying that obviously the most important thing is to get the patches in security updated because you're talking your passwords, everything being on the line. But there are people who already are saying, hey, there's also performance hits that come mm -hmm. with this patch. Yeah. Now, this is for Meltdown, I assume, specifically. Is there any going to be any impact on Spectre on performance or we don't know with that? It depends patch? on how they're, how they're going to work on this, how they're going to fix the Spectre issue. The, the kernel team has already announced there are some... Uh, issues with like the spec the specter fix that they're going to probably have a little bit of a performance hit but most of the the melt the performance hit is the meltdown issue um i would say there probably would be at least a little bit of percentage for specter but it wouldn't be as um as noticeable as like the bigger hit of like when you compile something the meltdown issue is going to be a lot more noticeable well that was what i was going to ask you what kind of how much of a performance hit are we talking once everything's patched well unfortunately it's 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 kind of impossible to say uh, at the moment because we'll have to see 
once the once just patches have been made and once the benchmarks have been made, we can say give it like an actual estimate. But right now, the range is huge as far as how far it affects people and what they do. Uh, but as far as desktop usage goes, with the various different types of way you do things. So, for example, if you're if you just use like word processing, you just use a browser, you play video games, or even video uh, video editing. Um, those things are typically not affected at all. And if they are affected, it's very small, like maybe 2%. You wouldn't really notice it most of the time. But when it comes to virtualization or compiling or really high intensive CPU tasks, those will be hit quite a bit. We don't know exactly how, how much, but the estimates are up to 30%, but that's typically a maximum. So I would say that the average would be somewhere in the middle. Um, but for that's for the more, you know, I would say the comp, the compilation of software would probably be like the higher end, like the 30% and then like virtualization be around 20% or so, but that's just estimates right now. And it depends on all the different types of variables, like which processor you're using to do the compiling, what, like, um, which, which one are you trying to mitigate the meltdown or the specter, which one is going to hit you the most things like that. And as far as, um, like also the, even the architecture, cause like some people who are using ARM to compile wouldn't necessarily have a problem with the same way that Meltdown has because only one ARM chip is, is affected by Meltdown. So we have a big vulnerability, two actually, yep. and we're at the mercy of everybody patching everything. And it's a scary thing for somebody who's just a regular user who's just waiting to get, you know, get the patches in. Yeah. So my question is, how many more are there out there that we don't know about yet that are like this? Uh, well, I would say not like this, probably not a lot because this is a, this is a huge issue that is, is hardware affecting. And if they were, if they were going to be any more that are like this, that are already known, then they would probably be fixed at the same time. These, this would be fixed when the, like the new heart versions of the hardware come out. Right. Well, yes. I'm more concerned about what we don't know. Like what they haven't found yet, or yeah, right. how maybe. long has this been around that nobody's seen? Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, technically, the the problem with it is uh from the '60s, so wow. the like the actual issue was not created until roughly about like 15, 10, 15 years ago, but the the concept of speculative execution was created in the '60s, and back then we didn't have to worry about the you know the overlap of being able to use one side to the other and attack the other because they were really isolated systems. So that concept didn't really matter then. But now that we are still using that type of uh, execution on the processors that are now are much more faster and much more um, versatile as far as how they can connect, interconnect to the various different pieces of the system, it's become a much more uh, obvious problem that, um, well, obvious now that you think about it. Cause once they, once they explain what the problem is from, it's like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Like they wouldn't have they wouldn't have anticipated that kind of an issue because they were talking about mainframes and stuff back then. On a final note, we saw a news article regarding Microsoft halting some of their patching for AMD certain AMD chips. I think it was Phenom or pre Phenom because they're basically creating no bootable state once they patch it with mm -hmm. these certain processors. So there's people are excited because they're getting patches and people are getting patches and it's breaking their machines. So it's a pretty interesting time uh, here with this stuff. There is a nice thing to talk about Linux. There was a patch that was being put into the kernel for AMD hardware, but I, AMD uh, contacted the kernel team and said that we don't, we don't think you need to include this patch. We've already doing it on our side. So to mitigate the process hit or the, you know, the performance hit, the Linux kernel did not include that particular part of the m mitigation. Nice. Very so nice. like, so in some cases that it's, it might not be as, it, it definitely it's not gonna be as bad for AMD users. They won't see as much of a performance hit because maybe the, more reason to buy AMD, which we have some articles <laughs> about below. Right. Rocker? Right. <laughs> and also uh raspberry Pi is using z these different types of uh, the different sp specific versions of the arm chip and that are not affected by specter or meltdown at all. Very nice. So that that's very convenient for anyone who's us using like raspberry Pi to, you know, hobbyist stuff. All right. Mike, thank you very much for coming on and giving us your yes, expertise. Thank you. much last you minute, you. nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Last minute and able to talk at that level. How cool is that? <laughs> thank, thank you. you.
Thank you, Michael, for coming on the show and explaining it. Now, that was recorded a couple days ago, and this isn't going to release till Monday. And so all the information is fluid. There's so many changes going on. The updates should already be out by the time this releases. So that was just a, a, a quick snapshot of what Meltdown Inspector was and the scope of it. So Awesome. So, Rocco, let me ask you, on your router... Do you use the proper WPA2 plus AES, which is the most secure right now? I do. Okay. Are you sure? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like a WEP kind of guy. Maybe. So in the news, they're talking about the Wi-Fi Alliance has announced a new standard for the routers, which is WPA3. And obviously, since the number goes from two to three, three is better, right? It's more better. It's more better, but there's some awesome features coming with three, such as individualized data encryption, uh, keeping these devices from snooping on each other. So essentially you're going to have an encrypted uh, connection between two devices now as they're communicating with your router, uh, which is awesome, right? Well, the question is, this is all, this is good news, but this is how, how far along is this? This is a concept. Uh, what will we have to do to get this new WPA3 standard? Will we have to buy new hardware? What's the deal with it? Well, definitely will be new hardware that will come out. And once they set these standards, generally the manufacturers will start following it. So you'll start seeing them roll out with WPA3 uh, equipment out there. Now, if you go buy WPA3 equipment, it's still going to be compatible with WPA2, et cetera. So you're not going to have to buy all new devices. Uh, you may buy a new router. You don't have to, but it's got some new, it's got some cool features. The other one's like the brute force attacks. Uh, it has the ability to limit that because it doesn't constantly allow you for endless passwords to be entered when you go to your router administrative login. It actually stops it. So right now, until, like until this happens, what's the, what's the best security on the router right now? WPA2 plus AES is your best bet right now. So you can go into your router uh, and every router for the most part is going to have instructions on there of how to get into it. But you go to your IP address, your router, put in your password, username and password. If you don't know what it is, it's probably the default. You need to change that. <laughs> um, and uh, you can go and check and make sure you're on the WPA2 plus AES standard out there. So that's it. WPA3 equipment coming okay. out soon. So what you're saying is we got to spend more money. More money, but you get better stuff. I don't know. It just seems like it it seems like a, a a cat and mouse game, dude, where it's constantly, you know, you 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 need better security, so you got to buy more hardware or newer hardware. It just seems like a game, I don't know. I mean, How I know it's down the rabbit hole do you want to go, right? Right. <laughs> All right, so uh, Ubuntu 1710. So they had an issue with uh, Lenovo laptops and a few other ones, and we covered that Acer, before. Acer, Dell, yeah. Yep. Well, they have updated the ISOs, and now they have re-released them. So you can now download the new releases. And they actually had taken them. They said they had taken them down, and they might have taken them down for a little bit. But even a couple days after that, you were still able to download the ISO. It was just It just had a big you know, red box in the middle of the screen saying, you know, hey, if you have a Lenovo laptop or whatever, don't download this. And so it still allowed you to download it, but it, uh, this is the new updates to the ISO so that you won't have that problem no longer. So there's no... So that, that's the feature that comes with this re-release is no longer Bricks laptops. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that feature. That's amazing. <clears throat> All right. Um I don't think we want to like labor that too much because that's like um, it's fixed. It's, it's fixed. Done. It's done. It's over with. It's, it's old yeah. news. So official support for Ubuntu seventeen oh four. Do you do you uh, know anybody that runs seventeen oh four? No. Well, no. Do you? No. Who runs the <laughs> the, the mid release, dude? I mean, you may run it right when it first comes out, but who runs it after? You're that? like, nah, not interested. No, like once seventeen. Like once the dot ten release comes out, nobody runs the mid dot oh four release. So, well, that's when I came back. I came back at seventeen ten, so that's why I, I never played with seventeen oh four. Well, if you do run seventeen oh four, the support mm -hmm. for it ends. Well, by the time this gets released, it'll be ended. 
So. That don't seem like it lasted long. Well, the problem here is not the fact that it's the support is ending or like the title says the support is ending, but there will be no updates whatsoever. None. No security updates, no critical fixes, nothing. Wow. Like zip, nothing. So if you're running it, you need to like either install 1604 LTS or upgrade to 1710. So 1704 is a ticking time bomb of security. That's what you're saying. And it will have gone off by the time this releases. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I think we need some good news here, don't we? Uh, let's talk about Arch Labs. I'm a huge Arch person, Rocco. And if you were to look in my Linux heart mm-hmm. and open it up, there would be a big spot in my heart reserved for Arch. Arch-based distributions. I love them. Mm-hmm. You know that I've been absolutely infatuated with a recommendation that you made called Arch Merch. Yep. Before KDE, KDE Neon, I think all seven of my computers were migrated to Arch Merch. Some of them are still on Arch Merch. Okay, so think, let me ask you. Uh-huh. If you had to pick right now. Right. Arch Merch, KDE Neon. Arch Merch. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, continue I, on, sir. So, one, you know, I always love exploring new Arch-based distros. So Arch Labs is out there which is uh, well known and they have, they had a new release recently, uh, 2017.12 release. Yep. And uh, there's a problem though, Rocco. What's the problem, dude? <laughs> Look, I really want to try this distro, but there are, there are times where decisions are made and I understand and lives are that, lost and lives are lost. <laughs> and so they recently changed arch labs to have an, uh, ABIF installer. Yes. And the ABIF installer is the equivalent of getting in a time machine and going to 1985. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> it's a text-based installer. And it's there. Look, if you are a Linux admin professionally and you deal with installs all day long, I'm sure you look at it and go, Oh, even a caveman could use this. But I look at this thing and go, this is three steps backwards. And I I, I tried to install it in a virtual machine. And I couldn't even get it to work there. It is something that you can get. Like you said, if you're versed enough in it, you can get through it. But for mm-hmm. uh, a, a semi-newer user, somebody who's not familiar with that kind of installer, it's going to be tough. Like, okay, I'm familiar with that. But when I installed it in GNOME boxes, and it said, and it asked you for your what partition, I was even scared <laughs> that it right. would somehow go out of GNOME boxes and, <laughs> and kill one of my drives or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, we got through the installer, but it still wouldn't boot in in GNOME boxes. So I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to put it on actual hardware, but I don't think I'm going to try that right now. So, I mean, they, they have a lot of update, you know, a lot of little tweaks and things that unfortunately I don't, I won't get to see. And I've heard a lot of great things about this distro. I just, I, and, and I saw that the developers mentioned specifically, they did this because they felt ABIF was a more um, fine tuned installer, less issues than their prior installer and that you have more control. And I could tell that there's probably more control in there. But at the same time, there is so much more control that it's confusing. And uh, I know the dev developer said they're also going to release potentially uh, basically a manual to show people how to install it. But there you go. At the point where you've got to go create a manual or some steps or special guides to do something, maybe you're going in the wrong direction. I mean, but they could do whatever they want. It's just my personal opinion. You're losing a lot of novice Linux users when you do stuff like that. Yeah, because what happens is you're trying to make it better. And, you know, like you said, it's their distro. They can do whatever they want with it. But if Mm -hmm. you want it to be used by the masses or you want it to be used by as many people as you can get, maybe not the masses is the wrong word, but if you want it to be used as by as many as people as you can get, you need to make it as easy as you can get it to allow them to do that. And I think this is a not a, it's not a step in the 
in a wrong direction as far as the oper- the distro or the operating system itself. But I think yeah. for usability, it's a step in the wrong direction. So Agreed. I mean, Linux has come a long way when it comes to installation, right? Now it's, in my opinion, it's easier to, to install than any other operating system out there, period. But if you start going to stuff like this, that's not going to be the case anymore, right? If everybody started switching to these text-based installers, and you're trying to convince somebody to switch to Linux and you're showing them this, they're going to be like, are you, are you kidding me right now? Um, because it's just, it probably is extremely powerful because it's text-based, but it's also extremely uh, threatening. So I, I hope that they actually change their mind on this. I really do because I think it hurts. I, I personally think it hurts Linux a little bit when you have distros out there with installers that look like that. My personal opinion, but I guess we should move on now. All right. So let's move on to some better news. So how cool is Dolphin Oracle and the MX-17 team? I I love this guy. I really, really do. He not only supports my channel, he's been on my personal channel supporting me for before I even joined the show uh, when I did an uh, MX-based release and things like that. But he still continues to support content that's out there. He shows up on your Saturday shows uh, occasionally there. And he also hooked up PZ, and everybody loves Producer Zeb. Yep. So the people that have been to the Biddle, Big Daddy Linux Live on Saturday night, check it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug. Um, for the people who have been there, we've talked about it where there was an issue and you could change ownership of files and folders to root, which would then kind of like really mess up a lot of different things. And what they did was they went in and they changed an option to allow you to remove that. So if you're setting up a system for somebody and you don't want them to mess that up in any way, now you can remove that option. And it just goes to show you that people in the Linux community, guys like Dolphin Oracle, listen to uh, the community when there's a problem. Dolphin's one of the best at listening to the community. And this shows it, right? He, he really cares about what people think in their opinions and is not going to just do stuff that's best for what he feels for him or the, you know, the folks that work with him. He's going to do what the community asks for. And that's why I love it. And look, it shows all over MX. MX is incredible. We've got a lot of people in Telegram that have moved to MX since we had Dolphin on. And I'm so happy to see the support because it's one of my favorite distributions, period, and uh, very happy to see MX getting a lot more love because it deserves it. Yep. Well, one of my <laughs> one of my favorite OSs <laughs> of all time. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I can't stop laughing uh, when you say that. <clears throat> okay. One of my fa- no, it's not one of my favorites, but no. Um, I know Matt Dark One will. Uh-huh. Love this recommendation because I recommended this to Matt a long time ago, and oh yeah, and he really didn't take me up on it, but I think he should now. So after hearing this, he will React OS mm. released a new version. Yep. So, what are your thoughts on React OS? React OS is not a Linux based distro, but rather a distro based on Windows. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that surprised me, though, about this whole thing is I went uh-huh. looking and they have a ton of developers working on this thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine what we could do in a Linux community if we had all these probably very talented people working on something that really matters. Well, okay. So to give them a little bit of credit, I mean, they do do a lot of work on this. It, it nice. is a free and open source alternative to windows that looks like windows that looks like not just windows but like windows. you can theme it with windows like version 3.1 you know like improve styling for windows xp theme quick shell improvements clipboard and recycle bin crashing fixed look i i think that the people who do this stuff are insanely talented i'm just like why not spend your time in linux why confuse the market more and have a Windows, but not really Windows-based open source operating system. This reminds me of JNode, that JavaScript operating system someone tried to create at some point. I, I'm just confused. I it, it looks interesting. I did try to download and play it, but it was all zip files. And I just, 
I kind of got disgusted with myself and stopped. So you really, you know, are cool with it and want to install it is what you're saying. It's my new daily driver. I love it. <laughs> I, I just, I, I just wish people would spend that with that much talent would spend their time in a Linux distro because I think that's where the battle's at. You got Mac OS, you got Windows, and you've got Linux. And you know, if you want to open source, go Linux. Right. That's 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 my plea to them. Come to the come to our side. Well, all right. Speaking of uh, distributions that look like Windows. Um, cooler windows. What you did this all to just get me triggered on this episode. I, did. <laughs> I put all this in there. <laughs> Hashtag triggered. Uh, okay, so the cooler right. windows is now live. They got a new release, and this is based on 16.04 LTS, runs uh-huh. Cinnamon 3.27, and it kind of looks like. Windows. Windows. Okay, so these guys kind of took my advice a little bit that I gave to React OS, and they're like, "Okay, we'll stay in we're Linux, but we're going to give you all the theming of Windows built right in here." So this is the one that has the theming for three point one, Windows eight. Who would want to theme their computer in that way if you just have nostalgia for three point one one or something like that? Uh, maybe. Who knows? Well. Look, there are people that like, and I don't mind the some of the Windows themes that are out there. Okay, like there are, were menus, like there was, there's actually a KDE menu, and the name is escaping me, but it looks like the Windows 10 tiled menu, and it's actually pretty nice. There's like Windows doesn't get everything wrong in theming, but I surely wouldn't want to go back to like XP or anything like that. So the 3.11, you remember those days? No. Those miraculous no. days of theming? No, I think I started in uh with 95, I believe. So uh, you was, skipped that fun, huh? Yeah, I was not involved too much with Windows at that time. Well, listen, Rocco, when we talk about beauty, we've got to move on here. We've got to talk about fat dog. Fat dog. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fat Dog 64 720 beta has been released, my friend. And, and let me tell you something. How fat is the dog? The dog is super fat. <laughs> uh, you're going to, you're, you would have, I think you would have a panic attack if you booted in the fat dog uh, just because of the theming. I probably would. Um, I think you'd probably fall out of your chair and just uh, have a complete panic attack. But, Keep in mind, Fat Dog is an extremely lightweight distro. And so even though it's Fat Dog, it's light. Does that make sense? Keep sure. Follow me here. Sure. And they also have an ARM version of Fat Dog. So if you have an ARM-based device, you can install that there. But they've got a bunch of new features out there for Fat Dog uh, to go check it out. And I did install it. Did you play with it? I downloaded it and I didn't get to play with it. So there you have it. You didn't even boot it in the boxes? No. All right. Well, your first impression would be uh, welcome to 1990. All right. (laughs) Man, this is a trend in these distros here. (laughs) Uh, A very ugly green wallpaper will greet you with a fat dog logo. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. What? Mm -hmm. Did you just Uh say green and ugly in the same sentence? Yeah. Like the green guy? Well, look, neon green is beautiful, but puke green is more like (laughs) on this one here. So you've got this puke green wallpaper. Uh, with a fat dog blurry graphic in the middle. Uh, and it reminds me of like using a palm device, like the old school palm ones, like the icon setups and stuff. Yeah. But with that said, um, you know, there's also no search function in the menu. So you've got that, but I'm sure that takes away some of the weight of the distro. It's ugly. Okay. But everything you would need is pre-installed there. So you've got MT Paint, all the light versions of apps, MT Paint. You've got SeaMonkey and that type of thing in there. So if you are looking for a very light distro, it's kind of cool in that way. It's ugly, but it's kind of cool. So it's a derivative of a puppy. So is it something that you don't want to install and just use on a USB or or is it something you want to install? I think if you had an older machine, let's say you go down to your local, you know, thrift shop and you grab an old Dell or something and you want to revitalize it, Fat Dog would be a cool choice for it. It's got 1,750 packages available for it. Uh, it's like I said, it's ugly, but if you, it's definitely the use case is for an old Linux machine. That's it. 
Old Linux machine, okay. Yeah, so, an old machine. So you're talking about it being ugly. So let's talk about one that's actually pretty nice looking and still light. Finally, some good news. <laughs> Finally, something that doesn't hashtag trigger me. <laughs> so Linux Lite 3.8 beta is out, and you can check it out and download it. And it runs XFCE, right? Dude. It runs XFCE, <laughs> and it's beautiful. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. It's pretty nice looking, man. I'm sorry. Oh, pretty nice. Come on. Keep it coming. You can do better than that. Wait. Keep it coming. The, it's pretty nice looking. Now, it is the beta, so uh -huh. there may be – I have heard issues. I know English Bob had mentioned that um, – installing it sometimes for him had issues with the partitioning so you may want to you know if you're going to try to install it on hardware you may want to wait until it's actually released uh, but downloading it installing it i didn't have no trouble installing it to a drive but either way uh it's it's a great looking light distribution it has some tools along with it what do you think of the tools man I love it. And this is the this is the perfect example of doing a light distribution correctly. Everything in there from the moment you boot in, even though it's light, is extremely well done. A beautiful splash page. It quick links immediately on that splash page once you're done installing to do update installs, update your drivers, do a, a restore point that you can set on your machine. So, so think about a new user. Yeah, it's comparable to MX Linux, where it has all of them tools to make everything easier. Yep. Where where we talked about Arch Labs, uh, going a little bit away from uh, being easy to use compared mm -hmm. to uh, Linux Lite or MX, where they have these tools that just make it so simple, dead simple yep. to install drivers or install software. Uh, they have a, a a software center basically where you bring it up and you just check the boxes of what you want installed. Exactly. It's awesome. I mean, just completely beautiful. You've got like um, a suite of light tools you were talking about, boot up, fix, clear memory, set defaults, system tweaks, all right there in a menu for you to click on and perform. So if you think about a Windows user coming to something like Linux Lite, they're going to instantly feel at home. You can go do the advanced things in Linux Lite. But the second you boot into it, you're going to feel like you're in a complete operating system. I like this. I would run this on my most powerful machine, even. I liked it that much. And it's XFCE. What's not? Well, what's there not to like? I mean, come on. I didn't test it out uh, deep. Like, I didn't go deep into testing as far as, like, if it has the same dual monitor issue for me. Because I would consider running it myself. But I want to get these guys on the show. Let's get them on the show. Let's get them on the show because they they deserve to have their voices heard and for me to tell them how awesome it is that they use XFCE, Rocco. Well, I've already contacted them or tried awesome. to contact them. So uh -huh. I sent them a message. We'll see what they say, see if they'll come on the show or not. The problem is every email you send, a little signature, I love Gnome, probably doesn't <laughs> help. <laughs> gnome automatically sends it because the word gnome is in there. Gnome, gnome. Uh, because of that word's in there, it sends it to the spam. Uh, yeah, that's smart. That's smart. So Linux Mint, we've talked about Linux Mint recently, and uh, I went on to my soapbox about people uh, needing to give Linux Mint another chance, but they've got Linux Mint 19 being targeted here, Rocco, for May or June. That's that's right around the corner, man. That's right. That's time's flying right now. That's right around the corner. Now, there isn't much that we know about it except for the fact that it's going to be codenamed Terra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it was the most clever name. Right? Well, well, they go in uh, female names alphabetically. So uh, the last one was Sarah. Uh, R S T U. Yeah. So. <laughs> X. Uh, help you out, Rocco. But. Um, <laughs> So there's not much we know about it, except that uh -huh. it will be based on the 1804 LTS. So right. We'll see what happens when it comes out. As far it, look, Linux Mint is always going to be stable. Yep, it's just the way it is. I mean, that's what it's there for, uh, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. That'll have a five year support on it, and it'll be supported till 2023. So anytime that you're going to install uh, a Linux Mint, you know that you're going to get supported, and you know you're going to be on a stable thing. 
No. I mean, they're saying, even though we don't have a lot of details, that this is going to be considered the most significant release since 2016. Right. I mean, that's two years ago, Rocco. Well. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into some software, I'll, shall we? I'll say. So we got some, I don't know what you would call it, good news, bad news. Um, uh-huh. So This is bad news. Do you like putting icons on your desktop i have to have icons on my desktop i have to have icons on my taskbars on my docs i have to have them on my desktop because here's how my workflow goes my brain thinks of something i need to click on it immediately that's where i go so i have the same icons all over. you've seen my theming videos haven't you rocco rocco <laughs> hey rocco I, you've seen them right <laughs> you, you've watched rocco Hello. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, GNOME 3.28 is going to remove the option uh-huh. to put icons on the desktop. Oh, great. So now it's more iPad-like. Yeah. Well, okay. So I am, uh, all honesty, I am not a desktop icon guy. I haven't been for a long time. So that mm-hmm. if I'm on a distro that puts icons on the desktop, uh, that's the first thing I turn off. Because I think it's like complete disaster to see 35 icons on the desktop i want to see the wallpaper that i have there or or the windows Mm -hmm. i have up so i don't really care about icons i usually use a dock but i think that it's the wrong move if you ask me to remove it but they do give some explanation of why they're removing it and whether you like the explanations or not these are their reasons why so Mm. i can't um, wait to hear it, well, it hasn't been maintained for a while, the part uh-huh. that actually makes that work. Okay, so they've okay. had to like continually fix it to keep it. like It hasn't been com- maintained constantly, so they have to go back and, hey, let's make this work. But it causes compositor issues. It causes uh, more code to be put into Nautilus itself. It has multi-monitor support problems. It's got all kinds of different issues behind the scenes that you know none of us regular users see. This is all the devs behind the scenes that they have to fix the code to make it work. Okay. And there's also benefits to porting to GTK4 if they remove this. Mm. So, I mean, there are technical reasons why it's being removed. I don't necessarily agree with the end result, but I can see where they're going with it. So in Linux, there's always a workaround. So if somebody says we're removing this feature some geek comes around like, no, you're not. All you got to do is do this. <laughs> I mean, is there some workarounds here that at least GNOME users, for whatever reason, uh, can work around this problem if they want to put stuff on their desktop? Well, on the dev site, they do give you a couple workarounds. One is to, to fork the Nautilus desktop, if you'd like. You can fork it. No, you, you make your own if desktop. You, if you don't like it, you just fork it. you don't like it, make your own. <laughs> Go read the manual, Dirk. Hopefully somebody would, like, you know, continually mm. maintain that. But you could use Nemo uh, to uh, actually cr- put the desktop icons on. You could make desktop icons a shell extension. Uh, mm-hmm. And they give you uh, ways to do this on the site as well. So I'll put the link in it. I just don't think, okay, the normal everyday user is not going to do this stuff. No, like, no, absolutely not. The people that, I mean, like like the normal everyday user who just installs GNOME and they say, it, well, like I said, this will be in 3.28, but when that comes out, they're just not going to go in and do this stuff. So, I mean, you you are the biggest GNOME fan I know. I like but GNOME. You, but you don't run GNOME. I'm not running GNOME right now, no. Why not? You've got a GNOME in the background. That loves XFCE. He loves XFCE. <laughs> and you love GNOME. I mean, if, if if I ask right now, your favorite desktop environment, GNOME will get mentioned. Absolutely. What's, ha- what's happened? Why don't you use it? Well, did I tell you I was playing around with Pop! OS? No. <laughs> so, Are you going back? No, I'm not going back. Uh, look, I, I booted into Pop! OS just to check it out and see what, what's uh-huh. going on with it lately. Right. And right. it is absolutely a beautiful a little tingling in your heart oh my god no (laughs) lie it was like wow this is awesome (laughs) yeah now was it the gnome feeling or just the theming pop os it it was both it was it was the gnome layout 
which I'm so used to, and right. also the pop themes that, I mean, it was just, it's just a, I'm sorry, it's just beautiful. Okay, yeah. so they add a few extensions in. I think they added four different ones uh, that were really good, and like the suspend button they put in and all this stuff. But I miss running GNOME as far as I miss that kind of workflow, but I also know the limitations that come with it. Like uh, right now, the system tray or the uh, whatever they call it now, the notification bar or mm -hmm. the icons are not working properly. And that's one of the reasons why I switched because it would disappear and come back and disappear and come back. Uh, so it's not perfected yet. And there are little quirks with it. But man, I'm, I really do like the look of no same way with kd neon though i mean well i mean look the <clears throat> there's not a better ipad like experience than no <laughs> <laughs> wait okay so tell me you didn't get that same feeling when you booted into kd neon <clears throat> that this is a beautiful desktop Oh, absolutely, KDE Neon, but not GNOME. GNOME to me is beautiful, don't get me wrong, but the workflow is my problem. The workflow of clicking a button and then you get this splash of all of your applications there. You know, I just want, I, I guess just because I'm used to it, I want that ability to just yeah, it's, not it's have muscle all memory. of that in my face, right? I just want, I want that over there and I've got other things over here on other screens. I don't need it taking up all that real estate. Uh, to, to do, but I installed pop OS as well and took a look at it. I didn't install it, install it in a virtual machine that, uh, in the past. I thought it's beautiful. I mean, and it looks great. I think KDE Neon's better looking than GNOME. I think there's more um, customization capabilities and those type of things easier in KDE than GNOME. I think XFCE trumps all of them. So there you go. Wow. And then I, I three for those Mensa members with high IQs. Look, <laughs> Forget i3, okay? <laughs> if you theme XFCE the right way, it is uh -huh. also a beautiful desktop. Well, I'll give you that. It's not quite as beautiful as GNOME or KDE, mm -hmm. uh, but it can look really good. So, And works all the time. Unless you're rock. Unless you're on my computer, and then it doesn't work all the time. <laughs> for Speaking everything. of working, there's some Linux uh, Roundup news here, Rocco. So some software that's released here for Wine 2.04 got 31 bug fixes. I know you're a huge Wine fan and use it all the time. No, you don't, do you? No, I, no, I don't. <laughs> but there are fixes there. Now, here's the important part. This is the part I like. What? The, the, these fixes mm -hmm. also help with two games, one of which is a massive empire of a game, League of Legends. Yep. Okay, so League of Legends gets an update, so now that it works better in Wine, which is fantastic, and Magic the Gathering, and you know Magic people, they're crazy. When they, they, they are into this game, they are really into it. Um, so the, if I go to my local comic book store and you run into some magic people, they're generally rich as well. Cause you see how much money they spend on those cards. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, anyways, uh, so that was really, even though I'm not a big wine person either, it's really cool to see them continuing to support two big games. Cause that's the big reasons why some people don't come to Linux is the gaming side. So having two mega games like that running better on Linux through wine. That's cool. I'm oh, yeah. down. With that. That's cool. Uh, another one is SoundNode. Now, mm -hmm. I've never used SoundNode, but this is an open source app that allows you to search and listen to music from SoundCloud. Now, this is a cool app. It's, it is a, it is an Electron app. Just saying. So it's going to have a huge install file. In case you are a <laughs> hater of Electron. Uh, but it does allow you to do this. And I haven't tried it, but I'm not a... Uh, SoundCloud, SoundCloud user as far as list. That's not where I go to get my music. I go yeah, to Google to get my music. Because right. Google hasn't bought it yet. But once they <laughs> buy it, you'll be all about it, right? <laughs> no, I don't use SoundCloud much either. I used to, which is funny, but I when I got, um, I think when I switched to Tidal and they had that hi-fi music, I went away from SoundCloud and I've just been jumping to the mainstream stuff. But I love the idea behind SoundCloud, but I just don't use it enough. So maybe I'll check that app out. Uh, also, one of the apps that got updated was Etcher, which is one of our favorites, bar none, as an ISO creator, right? Yeah. Well, we were talking about it in the Telegram group the other day, and mm -hmm. somebody had mentioned uh, a multi-US boot or something like that. But Etcher is one of the most dead simple, reliable USB writers out there, bar none. 
I won't use anything else. I'll use DD or etcher period. That's exactly. everything else ends up giving me a horrible experience where it doesn't write it quite right. I can't get the distro installed. I eventually find out it's because there's some issue with the writing of the ISO. So, but etcher, I never have that issue with DD. I don't have that issue with, it's just a little risky. Could I using- tell you that, uh, Ubuntu Mate has Etcher in the software boutique. Does it really? Just wow. Oh, yeah. uh, that's kind of a point in their favor. That's a point in their favor. I'll give you that. All right. So did you use Movie Monad? I did. I really, really dug this app. Really? Yes. It's a very, listen, if you just want to watch movies, you want no nonsense, you don't need a million options to convert this or change the bit rate. You just want it the best quality possible. Play me a stupid movie and leave me alone. The movie monad is for you. Uh, so it's, it's very simple, non-intrusive movie app. And sometimes that's what you want. You don't want things popping in your face and settings. You got to play with You just play the movie. Right. And that's what it did. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I watched my own videos and it, and, Got some popcorn and enjoyed my own videos. <laughs> wow. You watched your own videos. I watched myself. And I was That's impressed. Sad. That's sad. Uh, but it is offered as an app image and also as a Snap app. So that's a plus. <laughs> Not Brian's videos. Movie Monad is. You can, you can download my YouTube videos and watch them in Movie Monad. What an exciting weekend that will be. That would be pretty awesome. <laughs> Listen, I've you converted me. Um, what did you convert me to recently again? For what? what did I don't I know. You? You, you converted me to something. Oh yeah, the the mail app, Mailspring. You, Mailspring. Yeah. You converted me to Mailspring, but I brought you a greater gift. What did you bring me? Firefox. You did. I yes. will totally agree with it that you did say to me. You suggested that I give Firefox a try when Fifty Seven came out. Do I have to admit that, though? Yes, you have to. You can't cut this out of the show. I was hoping I could edit this part. <laughs> but so you're on Firefox now, right? I am completely switched over to Firefox. Whoa, completely? Complete. I don't use Chrome anymore at all. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, and to be, to be honest with you, there are quirks that I don't like about Firefox yet. Uh-huh. Um, there's a lot of good things about it. And one of them is the container tabs. And although I would, you know, a lot of people didn't like Chrome's way of handling that, which is you have an account username up at the top right corner and you can sign into an, under a new account and that will, you'll be able to sign into like say a second Gmail account or a second YouTube account and they'll right. be separated that way. But Firefox goes about it a different way with the uh, container tabs. And I think they actually work better than the way Google has it. In, in nice. Chrome. And what I can do is I can open up a new tab in, through the container tab extension and open it up into, uh, say, a destination Linux account. And everything will be signed into the destination Linux account. And yet then I can go to my main profile or just open a new tab and sign in under uh, big daddy Linux and everything's separated. I think it's awesome. That's very cool. Well, listen, it's uh, not just you who's converted, but uh, it's one of their fastest growing versions they've ever had at a hundred million plus profiles, fastest in history that they've gotten to a hundred million plus profiles and half a billion daily hours of use. Uh, that they're stating here. So they've seen a tremendous amount of growth and guess where most of their growth is coming from? Chrome users. Wow. That's pretty cool. I'm not, it, if you said that to me before they released, I would be shocked. But now that you say that to me after I use it, not, I'm not shocked at all. The add-ons are going strong. I know that was a big contention for you. Did you notice the shift in that, the add-ons? Uh, there are add-ons that, you know, obviously the legacy add-ons are not going to work. There are a few that I had to just, you know, kind of like let go and say, okay, <laughs> I can't have that one. But they were not like must-have. Yeah, they right. were not deal breakers that I got to have this add-on. Now, I do know I do have family members that have add-ons that they have to have, period, the end. So they have tried everything from Waterfox to um, other ones that Basilic, I think, is one of them as well. Um, so for me, it's not a deal breaker. 
So I've I've gone though to I've gone to Vivaldi, but I, I liked Firefox a lot. But I've been very happy with Vivaldi. So uh, you switched recently. to it full time. Yes, it's been for a couple of weeks now, full time Vivaldi on all my machines. So what do you like in Vivaldi better? What what brings you to Vivaldi more than Firefox? I I did a video about this. If you watched my channel, Rocco, who watches your channel, dude? <laughs> Really? Really? We're going to go there? Uh, uh, no. Um, no TuxDigital.com forward slash DosGeek. <laughs> Why TuxDigital.com? <laughs> DosGeek communities forward slash. No. Okay. Um, so here's the deal. I, I think there was a lot of drama going on with Mozilla for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were hitting me up to try Vivaldi. And even after when I made the video about Quantum when it first came out and was giving it tons of praise because it's awesome. And so I went to Vivaldi and I'm not saying you're getting a better experience necessarily, but you're getting as good of an experience. And there's some differences in there as far as, first of all, you can use all of the Chromium apps and all that extensions and those type of things. But uh, the security, because there is no sync option, I think is actually superior. So uh, you don't have the sync online account that people can assign you know, basically sign into or hack and get all your stuff synced. At the same time, it is a little bit of an inconvenience because you have to export once you get everything set up and to move it to a machine. But I just host that on my own internal server. So I like Vivaldi. It's very fast. It can run Netflix and, you know, all of the different silver lights and all that type of stuff. And I think it's a great little browser there. But a lot of people now are telling me Waterfox. So there you go. So have you run into any sites or many sites at all that have issues running in Vivaldi? Nothing. Mm -mm. It runs every site really, really well. Uh, I will tell you for a while I was having issues in Google Docs, but that was patched in the latest version of Vivaldi and I don't have that issue anymore. So, All right. So let's move on to some better news. Okay. Some... Better news about some hardware releasing, dude. Yeah, man. There's some <laughs> awesome stuff going on in the hardware world right now. So tell me about it. Dude, AMD is on fire, man. <laughs> they just won't stop. Just when you think that they're there and they're coasting, they just throw Intel another ball and just completely shake them off their ground. I mean, AMD this week announced that, hey, we know you guys really love these Ryzen CPUs and they're so popular that we can barely keep them in stock in a lot of places. But how about we drop the price of it too? Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, Intel doesn't know what's going on. So now you can get a the Threadripper 1900X for $100 less. So it wasn't like some little 1% discount here. You're getting 100 bucks off it. So now you can get a Threadripper which just being able to tell friends like, oh, what CPU to have a thread ripper? Yeah. It's intimidating. Martin right? in the Telegram group actually has a thread ripper. Uh, I think he paid like ridiculous price when it first came out, but he loves it. Listen, nobody can continue arguing with you when you tell them you got a thread ripper. They'll be like, oh, okay, never mind. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you're cool. You're cool, dude. You got a thread ripper. <laughs> uh, so then the Ryzen 7 1800X will be $349 now, another $100 savings. Bam! Ryzen 1700X will drop to 309 and Ryzen 5 will also get a discount on it. But you think they're done, Rocco. They're not done. They're adding more to the Ryzen family. Not only did they announce that there's going to be a second generation of Ryzen CPUs around the corner, so now Intel's just spitting their coffee all over their computers, going, what are we doing here? These guys are on fire. But they also released, added two new members to the family, the 2200G and the 2400G, that have onboard Radeon graphics uh, with them. So, And two new motherboards to hit the market. Dude, what's <laughs> going on with AMD, man? <laughs> It used to be a joke in some cases to say you were running an AMD and now mad respect, right? Well, the performance has been cut or the gap in performance has been cut between AMD and Intel. You know, it used to be that, you know, you if you wanted a, a good CPU or a performing CPU, you, you knew you were going to buy an Intel. And now right. the lines are being blurred where it's not so not so clear anymore. I want a thread ripper so bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not to be well, outdone, Intel is rolling out new CPUs. Oh, well, yeah? Are they excited? Well, okay. So kicking off CES 2018, 
Uh-huh. Intel launched new CPUs that were integrated with, get this, <laughs> I don't understand this, Radeon Vega M graphics. That's yeah, weird. Man. Is it not weird? That's weird. I, I, it's it's unique, you know, to see that Intel's going to be giving AMD another bone here. <laughs> They're kind of like, I don't know, surrendering a little bit. Uh, this is really good. And I love that Pharonix is already making posts about this, talking about how they're drooling at the mouth to get to play with these new Intels with integrated Radeon graphic GPUs in them. But I, I kind of, I give actually a lot of respect to Intel for doing this, giving their competitor a little boost in the GPU market as well. It's pretty cool. I mean, I could see this definitely being great for the mobile world, right? Well, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a big mobile. I don't use a lot of laptops or anything, so this doesn't really affect me. But for people that it does, it gives them options to buy. Mm-hmm. You know? like, options are always good. Yeah, and from a marketing standpoint, look, AMD's got the fire right now, so having a little Vegas sticker on the side of a laptop is probably going to help it sell in this world. So, how about if I get you a Christmas present? I would love a Christmas present, Rocco. Thank I mean, you. you have to wait until Christmas, obviously, but okay, okay, I'll wait. What are I you was, get? I was thinking about like I don't know, maybe Nvidia's sixty-five inch gaming monitor. I would cry, <laughs> dude. Could you imagine? Could you imagine I can't doing even. this show? My webcam would be like up here. It'd be like, you hey, would Rocco. have to sit back from that, like I don't know, across oh the gosh. room in order to actually work, dude. I mean, really? Well, listen, I've bought monitors uh, very recently, so I'm not in the market. But if you're you're in the market for one, just wait, because. NVIDIA's got a 65-inch 4K, 120 hertz, G-Sync enabled HDR gaming monster out there for you. So I guess, like this article says, it's not going to fit comfortably on the desktop. (laughs) Probably not, (laughs) unless you've got a really big desktop. (laughs) So they're calling these the big format gaming displays, or BFGD for short. And they've got all kinds of awesome things in them, including a built-in NVIDIA shield, Rocco. Built-in. You can wow. imagine these will probably be only a few hundred dollars. Yeah, I'm sure. That'd be, uh, that's why I told you. I just grab it, pick it up real quick for Christmas for you. No big <laughs> so deal. The shipping alone would be <laughs> ridiculous. But they, listen, this is, this is one of those dream things. that. Uh, but I, I, what I think is interesting about this is in a lot of markets, we talk about three screens, like your computer screen, your TV screen, your car screen, yep. right, in your phone. I guess that's four. But anyways, we talk about taking that's, over your That's degree. counting with the uh, intelligent I3 users. Yes, that's <laughs> I3 math right there. Um, well, we talk about taking over the screens. If you think about NVIDIA making this play here and having a built-in NVIDIA shield, where are most people going to put something that's 65 inches? Probably in your living room. Yep. So my guess is it's more of a play for NVIDIA to get into your living room than it is a play for the, you to put this on your desktop. It comes with incredible features like DCI-P3 color, quantum dots, all of these awesome, you know, obviously direct array backlighting, all of these newer technologies to make a beautiful picture. And I'm sure if you're going to spend thousands of dollars, which this is likely what it will cost, you're going to put it in your living room for your whole family to enjoy. Yep. I'm sure you are. But I can't wait for my Christmas present, Rocco. Well... When you get your Christmas present, you can tell us about what you're doing then. But <laughs> what are you playing this week? Dude, dude, Hollow Knight. I am so happy this game's on Linux. First of all, it's won a ton of awards. Have you heard of Hollow Knight? I have heard of it. I've not played it, not tried it, not got nothing for you. How about Game Informer, 9 out of 10. Destructoid Review, 10 out of 10. PC Gamer, 92 out of 100. What more do you need to know? This is a platformer. It's a beautiful platformer. It's won tons of awards. It has 16,000 very positive reviews on it. The developer is Team Cherry. The soundtrack is gorgeous. If you love platforming games, you have to. Listen to me. You have to pick this game up. (laughs) This is probably the best, one of the best platformers on Linux right now, period. Um, Forge your own paths in Hollow Knight, epic action adventure, vast kingdoms of insects and heroes, 
big exploration, classic hand-drawn 2D. I told you about the soundtrack, right? Because it is quite amazing. Yes, you did. Uh, it's beautiful. Did you know that you can buy not only Hollow Knight, you can buy that for fourteen ninety nine on Steam, but you can also buy Hollow Knight and the soundtrack for nineteen ninety eight. When a game can sell its soundtrack separately, <laughs> you know you got something going on, right? Or you're like you want to play it uh, separate. And the Hollow Knight, look, honestly, it's a ton of fun. I I use it in my Steam Link, so I link it downstairs, and I play Hollow Knight downstairs in my living room. My kids love watching it. It's just a really fun, beautiful game. So just wait till you can play Hollow Knight on that 65-inch screen. <laughs> I'll keep waiting. Be, <laughs> you'll be, like you'll be waiting, waiting for a while. while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I played Alien Isolation, uh -huh. and it was a really good game. I'm envious that you played that game. I watched it on Twitch like an idiot still playing it myself. I watched <clears throat> um, a guy called Artist Caleb, and mm -hmm. he's, a, he's got his own YouTube channel. I suggest you, if you like watching video gameplays, Artist Kaler right. has one of the best video gameplays out there because it's his personality that comes through every one of the videos where I enjoy probably watching his videos play the game than I actually do playing the game. Right. Because he's that's, so... That's a good streamer. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty awesome. But anyway, I watched him play Alien Isolation and then I mm -hmm. went and played Alien Isolation. But there's a new game coming out that reminds me of Alien Isolation. Yeah, and it looks beautiful, and it's coming to Linux, Rocco. It looks absolutely awesome, and if you <laughs> you got to watch the trailer. It's one of those trailers that like pulls you in, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of things like slow things going on, and then just like things out of nowhere, and it 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 is really good. I hope that the gameplay is as good as the trailer is. I love the panic that the trailer creates because when you have this, you're in outer space, the vastness of being in outer space and all of a sudden things start going wrong, right? Alarms start going off, parts start flying around the room. To me, that is just, that's one of those things that just instantly creates that, you know, panic or fear of being completely out of control, right? You have no control over fixing something uh, easily in the middle of space. And I think this trailer pulls that off beautifully, giving you that feeling of everything seems like it's in control. And then all of a sudden stuff starts going wrong a little bit and you're not quite sure where they're going with everything in the game. They just give you a little bit of a taste, but that taste was tempting enough for me to add it to my wish list. What about you? Definitely added to the wish list and can't wait till it comes out because yep. I want to, I definitely want to play that one. So there was another exciting release or mm -hmm. or release news about a game coming to Linux. <laughs> Descenders. Yeah, man. <laughs> Look, are you laughing? Uh, no, I'm laughing at this game because <laughs> you know the idea of me. I, I live in an area where people love to mountain bike. Like it's the equivalent to living in Aspen and skiing is mountain biking out here. But the first thing I'm like, look, I'm gonna run into a tree, break my leg and it's just going to be a bad experience, but I could play this game <laughs> and pretend I'm bike riding and uh, break my nose, nose dive into a tree. And I have none of the costs of a hospital. So, you know, I think that. this game could bring something to Linux that you don't see very often in games in Linux, where it just brings that excitement, that high, uh, the, the fast paced, Oh my gosh, I got to do this real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Moves and stuff. Yeah, there's there's racing games, there's car racing games and stuff, but uh, no, I don't think there's anything like this on Linux. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, yeah, I'm excited I, for this to come out. I agree. I mean, you got this. This is a biking game, which in itself doesn't sound super exciting. When you watch the trailer, you'll see why it is. It's super fast paced, really good looking graphics, procedurally generated world. Um, you know, you build your own character and reputation based on the jumps and things that you do. Looks super, super cool. Definitely a game worth checking out. Now, I don't see anything in here about it, but it would be awesome if the, there was a multiplayer aspect to this where you could play like, say, rock, say the similar to Rocket League where you could join up and 
do races and stuff like that. We could be people. bike buddies, we could Rocco. Be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I could like, you know, push you down the hill. Or <laughs> Why did you kick my bike? <laughs> uh, all right. Ultra Ball is another game. Now, Dark One in our Telegram recommended this game. Yep. He, he sent this out there and he's like, look, you guys like Rocket League? Check this game out. I think you're going to like it. And I think he's on to something here. I'd hate to say it, but I think he's on to something here. So it's like Rocket League, only with like metal warriors <laughs> where you run around the ring. You and... say that and make it sound so exciting. Well, I mean, the trailer does make it actually exciting. Uh, I don't yeah, know yeah. how the gameplay is going to be. The trailer to me um, is intriguing but i still it but it's cool it looks cool but i don't know how it'll actually play like how the feel will be when you actually play it so but it but i have to say that um liking rocket league i probably will be interested in this well yeah this is kind of a continuation of taking that sci-fi element right or that you know made up fantasy element of being in a robotic suit and playing sports uh, but it's got that sports feel in it too it looks pretty cool it looks like it would be a lot of fun is this this is a free multiplayer game too, right? Yes, it is. But see, this is like fantasy where Rocket League is real, dude. <laughs> Rocket League is real. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should have known better. But listen, there's another game we have to talk about, Rocco. We don't really have to talk about this, dude. This could have been in the game of the week. Wait, I'll, okay. I will say this. The talking about the game is probably more exciting than the actual game. How dare you, Rocco? <laughs> listen, do not listen to Rocco, guys. Go out there and check this awesome workout here. It's called Go For The Kill Mod. It's a CSGO mod. CSGO is amazing. Rocco, is CSGO amazing? CSGO is amazing. Now, imagine the amazingness of CSGO, but in a battle arena, just like PUBG. So now you have this battle arena, like, PUBG, Players Unknown Battlegrounds, or anything like that, and they basically made a mod to allow you to play it, and it's a ton of fun. It, it, See, this is exactly what he said to me, and that's <laughs> why I downloaded it and installed it. Wait, how did how many hoops did we have to go through to actually install the game, right? And then... <laughs> We go to like actually playing it. Oh no, you got to keep your browser window open. What? Why do I got to keep my browser window open? Oh, you got to you got to hit connect. Oh, you can't close that connect box because now you're not connected anymore. I think it was like I don't know twenty minutes before we actually got to play the game. <laughs> so it's a server side mod, and it requires just a little bit of work, Rocco, to get it up and running. Just a little bit of installation and things. Nothing terrible. You know, Rocket League. I just hit play. The, and you got the shrinking maps, and you're going in there. You're you drop in the map. You get as many guns as possible. And I hooked you up, Rocco. I gave you awesome training. You did give me some good training. <laughs> Not that we ever got to use it, but you gave me good training because <laughs> we died like immediately. <laughs> but anyways, you drop into the world, and you're basically trying to be the last battleground, last person standing uh, to win. Now I've never been the last person standing. I know that's shocking, but it, it really is fun. Rocco doesn't have the patience to wait because some of the games take a little time to set up and, uh, the servers are only, Shall we in... talk about the round that you couldn't pick up a gun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, there's a little bugs here and there. Okay. Just little ones like Wait, being able to wait, protect me. I can't pick up a gun. Protect me. <laughs> so I was literally following Rocco around with my fist. <laughs> wait, there's guys behind me. Shoot him. Shoot him. He's shooting me. I'm like, come on, man. Like, like really? come on, I got you. So All okay, right. so the game has the game has some promise to it. It's got some bugs in it. It's got some promise to it. It's just not my kind it's of game. It's a cool idea. It's, it's just, a cool idea. It's a cool idea. It's just not my kind of game. It's a lot of uh, you know, same thing as PUBG where hurry you hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. You're scavenging for things only to now they are smaller maps. So you do mm -hmm. see people more often than you do in PUBG because PUBG, the maps are humongous and, you know, it can be a while before you see somebody. Um, but there was issues where, you know, you would have, there's not a, as much control as when you're dropping yeah. in. So the with the smaller maps, you don't have as big a space to drop in. So you have people dropping in right next to you. And as soon as they pick up a gun, you know, you're dead. 
<laughs> yeah. There's there's a lot of that dying piece. And uh, but I what's neat is supposedly there's a rumor out there that Valve is going to make an official CSGO mod uh for Battlegrounds. So if that ever comes to fruition, maybe that's like a Half-Life 3 rumor, who knows? But if that ever came to fruition, if you start practicing and go for the kill mod, Half-Life 3 is coming be out. Ready. Before you play Go for the Kill, that is? Half-Life 3 is coming out. <laughs> someday. Is it? Someday yeah. it's going to come out. It might. I know it, it might. is. Well, there you go. Confirmed here, Half-Life 3. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm not into MMOs, but you are. MMOs got me into computer gaming to begin with. Before that, I was a console gamer, and then something called Ultima Online came out. You could trace that back to figure out when I started in computer gaming. And when Ultima Online came out, I fell in love with gaming on computers that eventually turned into EverQuest. And those were my games. I played nothing but massive multiplayer online games. There's not a lot of options in Linux for massive multiplayer online games. I mean, you could download Wine and play some of them, but in, and really MMOs have dropped off the map a lot. They, haven't, they don't have the popularity they used to have. But Albion Online obviously is one that I've played, and it's okay. It's just okay. Uh, but I found another one recently called Project Gorgon, and it's completely free. You can download this game, and it reminds me a lot of a little bit revamped EverQuest graphics. So not super great graphics, but that kind of grind and skill building MMO world where you're meeting other players and teaming up to go fight in dungeons and stuff. It's all there. Very, very cool. And I've had a lot of fun playing it. Plus, it's completely free. So worth going out there and checking out. And the developers are interested in supporting Linux. So they put what they're calling a trial kind of download file out there and they want you to report bugs on it and things and stuff's working great in it so far. So they're they're trying to expand in the Linux. Hey man, it may not be my kind of game, but the more games we have on Linux, the better it's going to be for everybody involved. So yep. hey, hats off to them. So either way, go out there and give them some love on the forum, thanking them for it, even if it's not your type of thing. Well, what is your type of thing, Ryan? Oh, man, somebody awesome gave me an awesome Christmas gift. They gave me a Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War 3 key. Yeah. A game that's been on my wish list literally for probably well over a year. And somebody that's finally not the, that That's not the news. That's not the news, but let's, let's just take a moment and say, Rocco, thank you for doing something nice to, for me. <laughs> it was really nice to give me a key. Anyway. Feral <laughs> Interactive, which is like the best people in the world, uh -huh. they patched Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War 3. Yep. To fix Specifically it. for the Vulcan. Yes. So tell me about Warhammer Dawn of War 3. Tell me about it. No, I haven't played it yet. What? I haven't played it yet. How can you but not it's, play it's, it It's yet? like an XCOM real-time strategy game because I, I, I was distro hopping and then I downloaded it in Arch, and then I moved to KD Neon, and I haven't re-downloaded it yet. Nice. But I will, Rocco, because when I commit to it, it's going to be full-time. <laughs> no more You'll Rocket League for you, huh? Yeah, no more Rocket League. It's going to be all this game here. Listen, speaking of Rocket League, they've hit 40 million players worldwide. It's doing pretty well. One uh, of our favorite games. 40 million players. Amazing, dude. It's not going anywhere can, anytime can I, soon. Can I do? Can we? Can we take credit for the, some of that? The fact that it runs on Linux. We could take credit for two or three of those people. I don't mean. I don't mean like <laughs> we, as in me and you. I mean we, as in Linux, the Linux community can take credit for some of those forty million players. Well, we have to be able to. I mean, this is a big. This is a big AAA game. Linux definitely helps support this, right? This forty million players. We're at least thirty-nine million of the forty million. You know what's all, the only thing better than Rocket League? What's that? Uh, Destination Linux Apparel. <laughs> oh, Rocco, tell me more about Destination Linux Apparel. <laughs> well, you can go to teespring.com uh -huh. slash Destination Linux podcast. I'm writing this down. Uh -huh. Destination Linux podcast. Got it? Got it. All one word. Yeah. And you and can what? pick up t-shirts, mugs, sweatshirts. Man. Pretty much all kinds of different things with your favorite logo on it. I mean, obviously, Destination Linux would be your favorite logo. I only like to buy stuff if I've seen it first. 
Yeah. Yeah, you right see there. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, yes. all joking aside, if you'd like to uh, support us in any way, uh, you can go to teespring.com forward slash Destination Links podcast and pick up some apparel. And we have, of course, our Patreons we'd like to thank. And we have uh, Libra Pay set up as well for those who uh, want an alternative to Patreon out there. So we've got all of that set up for your enjoyment. So what are you going to be doing this week, man? You know, this week, I think I'm, there's a high, <laughs> there's, a really, <laughs> there's a really high chance I'm going to distro hop. To? On my main machine. To? I don't know. I don't know. Do you have yeah. a recommendation? Linux Lite. I'm thinking Manjaro. Linux Lite. 3.6. Lite. 3.6. On my main, the beast. You want me to go Linux Lite? Why not? It could eat it. <laughs> breakfast, dinner, and lunch. It won't even know anything's running on it. That's probably, how, the power will probably remain off. That's how fast it will be. Okay. Maybe Linux Lite then. Maybe next week I'll come on and talk about Linux Lite. If, I'll tell you what, if the Linux Lite folks confirm an appointment for a interview on Destination Linux, I will switch the beast to Linux Lite. To Linux Lite. Deal. Done deal. That's fair. That's very fair. That's a fair, that's a fair thing. Yep. All right. So thank you for listening. Thank you to all of the Telegram people. Yep. And you can join us Saturday night for Big Daddy Links Live if you'd like to do that. But otherwise, we will see you next week. Everybody have a great week. And remember, the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast. Uh, <sighs> we got a show to do, man. Quit fooling around. Stop it. <laughs> I'm trying to get articles up here. It could just be like, hi. <laughs> Michael, Michael Motorcycle. Right. What are you doing? Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
and all of a sudden, in one second, this gets messed up. Like, hours upon hours of, of actually trying to get this to be pixel perfect. And in one second, it's all gone. And nobody cares. Nobody cares. That's why I don't complain, because nobody listens. It's beautiful, Rock. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Rocco, maybe tomorrow we'll do some uh, Go For The Kill. <laughs> I might be busy tomorrow, dude. I might be busy tomorrow. Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll be ready for the go for the kill mod, man. I'll have it up. All right.